Jacob Edgar, welcome to KCSU. So good to have you. Thank you. Sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, happy to be here over the Zoom lines. Yes, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you. I've been watching your work and, you know, I'm a huge fan and, and I've also uh, been watching Putumayo, so the two of you are my two favorite labels. And I wanted to start by having you walk us through the timeline of Kumbancha. And before you dive into the timeline, can you explain to us what Kumbancha means? Kumbancha is an Afro-Cuban word uh, that basically means an impromptu musical party. So if you if you get together with friends and you have a, a guitar and a bottle of rum, and the next thing you know, it's five in the morning, that's a kumbancha. Uh, and I, I, I got the idea for that word because I, I'm a big fan of Cuban music and I studied Cuban music uh, for my master's degree and it just seemed like uh, the right the right word for the label. It's kind of like a, a jam or jamming or in Brazilian terms, I think we could say faja, vamos fazer uma faja. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So walk us through the process. You you had a beginning. When did that take place and what was the idea and what's the timeline of Kumbancha from the beginning yeah. to today? Well, Kumbancha was born officially in April of 2006. And I started the label after many years in the music industry and after many years working as the head of A&R for Putumayo, which as some of your listeners may know is a um, global music record label. Um, and my job for Putumayo for, for many years and actually up until today uh, has been to travel around the world and find music for their compilations. It's a great gig and uh, it's a really fun company to work for, but I was frustrated because Putumayo really only does compilations. And I kept running into or getting to know artists that um, I really felt needed some help just developing their artistic career. So I started Kumbancha in 2006 with the idea of signing full artists and developing artists to my record label. And, and beautifully, when I went to the president of Putumayo, I told him I was going to start the label and uh, start my own company rather than getting upset and, you know, firing me right then and there. He said, uh, sounds like a great idea if you want to keep doing what you're doing for Putumayo and we'll become an investor in uh, your company. We'll be happy to, to help you out. So it worked out really well when I started Kumbancha to have that partnership in place with Putumayo and we yeah. were instantly distributed worldwide and it was really nice. That is a great thing that you can work in partnership. So then, so that's 2006. So what happened next? Who is the first artist artist you signed and when? Right. So <clears throat> we, uh, the, the starting of my label corresponded with my move. My family and I moved from Brooklyn to Vermont. And Vermont is where we started officially the company. And uh, the first release that I put out was with a band from London that blended Cuban and Jamaican and British musicians. It was called Ska Cubano. Oh, or I love Ska. them. I have, yeah. I have a few of their songs. I played a few of their songs when I used to DJ in Pittsburgh. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the first record Kumbancha ever released was uh, was Ay Caramba, the Ska yeah, Cubano yeah. record. <laughs> That's the song I played a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love the idea of the band. I love the notion of mixing these different uh, cultures and communities. And uh, ironically, now we, here we are, however, 15 years later, and I have a new project coming out, and I've been releasing singles called Havana Meets Kingston, which is a totally separate project, but is also the fusion of Jamaican and Cuban music and culture. So it's interesting after all these years that I'm, I'm still fixated with this, this idea of bringing these two musical cultures together. That is awesome. Yeah, I've, I've played some of the songs from, from that project here on, um, on KZSU Global Jinga. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I love the fusion as well. Yeah, me too. They're, they're, it's like peanut butter and jelly. So in 2000, so you're, you signed the first artist in 2006. That was also Yeah, that was our first release. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> it, it 2006, 
corresponded with the uh, year that Tower Records went out of business. That was the year Tower Records went out of business. So the very first year that I started my record label, I instantly lost tens of thousands of dollars when, when Tower went bust. So I had this great launch and put all this music in the market and then immediately realized what a uh, risky business <laughs> the record business can be. <laughs> And, um, but luckily I, I had the support of Putumayo and I had my own uh, kind of means. And uh, so we were able to keep Kumbansha going. We ended up releasing um, four or five albums in that first year. We had the Idan Reichel project from Israel. We put out a record with Andy Palacio and the Garifana Collective. We put out a record with Habib Kwate from Mali and Dobe Niore from the Ivory Coast. and. Since then, we've been putting out anywhere from five new records a year, sometimes down to just one. Um, I'll tell you, in the past uh, couple of years during the coronavirus pandemic, we've really been focused on digital only releases. That's been a big transformation in our business model and putting out mostly singles. So digital singles with music videos to accompany them. And uh, the only full length album we put out in the past year was Dobe Niore's latest record. Um, and other than that, it's been really, it's been really fun to try new models and new approaches, and always try new new ways to uh, to introduce people to music. I have so many questions um, about that, and and coming from different angles. So, uh, yeah. I'm gonna come to you as a listener. I'm gonna come to you as a presenter of world music myself, and I also do another segment called the Job Search Empowerment News. So I always like to. Talk a little bit about the career, how you got started and, and how feasible is the career. So just bear with me. Sure, um, no problem. <laughs> so <clears throat> from a listener, you know it's hard because we are presenting music that is not mainstream music and we are in the United States of America, which I really appreciate and I definitely appreciate California for being more open-minded there's so much multiculturalism in california people are very open it's almost a way of life i don't think we're there yet it's not like people people tune into a radio a radio station and you get music from different countries which is what i do global jinga it's like you're just changing the station and you're going to a different country that's not a way of life yet um, yeah. so how do you attract, how do you find the audience for your artists? Well, it's really interesting because um, one of the things that I learned through my time at Putumayo, and one of the things that they did so well was find new audiences for global music and culture. And at the time when Putumayo was starting, it was still a niche, you know, and it's always been kind of this peripheral uh, attitude and genre, especially in the United States. But what Putumayo demonstrated through their success was that actually a lot of people are interested in international music and culture. And a lot of people are really uh, desire the opportunity to learn more about the world around them. And music is a great vehicle for doing that. The problem that we have is that the mainstream media, the, uh, the, uh, the radio stations, you know, so much of our consumer culture is dominated by, you know, kind of the latest trends, the latest fashions. And uh, so you have to find this community of people, you know, these people who are, are interested in the world around them. And that's always been the trick. How do you bring this music and find y your audience? And the reality is we're everywhere. I mean, all over the planet, all over the country, in every pocket from the most conservative to the most liberal, you're going to find people who are fascinated with learning about music and, and learning about other cultures. And so you just have to basically go around mainstream media. You have to use it when you can and get, you know, if you can get a 60 minutes story or if you can get some New York Times articles going, hallelujah. But if you can't, then you just have to build your audience through grassroots, spread the word, get your name out there and uh, do what you can to, to communicate with, with a potential fan base. So I, I, I feel like the market for quote unquote world music or global music is actually huge. It's one of the biggest markets in the world. Um, it's just not served by mainstream media. Um, so, you know, it, it's actually been fairly 
uh, interesting to see how popular sometimes the music that I work with can get. So you don't have any specific information on the demographics that make up uh, these individuals. And like, let's say in the United States, um, for me, I think in the past, I observed that the hipster community was very open to world music. When mm. I used to DJ at a club every last Saturday night of the month, we used to have a so party next door. It was like a so party it was a very interesting vibe because they played a lot of soul and funk music, like the um, the music from the UK, so and, and funk from the UK, like very rare music. And on the other side, I would be spinning music from around the world and I would do themes as well. And um, hipsters loved it. I felt like the, the dancing crowd didn't like it so much because they came in with that attitude, I'm gonna dance salsa and I would play salsa for 20 minutes and then I would be on to something else. So they enjoyed a, a bit of it, but if I played like Brazilian carnival music or reggae, they didn't know what to do with themselves because right. they needed to be spinning people around the dance floor. Um, but I found that the second generation, uh, foreign born second generation, they were also very open. So those would be mm -hmm. like my children. They uh, were born in the US, but they have the, the nationality the Brazilian nationality, the Brazilian passport, so they've seen the culture. And so they have somewhat of a familiar, familiarity with the culture, but not too much. And uh, so then you'd find those people in colleges and, and universities. And, and I think that's what I was um, drawing, those, those individuals. So we had a lot of um, fun, uh, fun nights and mix things up. I would say my Brazilian and my Colombian were some of the most uh, popular nights, but I really enjoyed it. So now we have um, the party is on the radio, so it's on KCSU and um, and I continue to, to play and, and the pandemic gave me an opportunity to do more of these interviews, which I really appreciate. But other than that, that's what I've observed about my demographics in, in yeah. the U.S. Does it kind of like match with your idea? Yeah, I mean, to some degree, I think you've touched on something that's really important to consider is that you have you have a, a wide variety of different types of audiences. You know, I mean, that's the thing. We're talking about music that might not be popular in the US, but it may be immensely popular in the country where it came from. So there are household names in Brazil that people in the US don't know. Um, and that the same goes for Greek music or Israeli music or, you know, any country you can think of in the world has artists that are superstars in their home country that aren't necessarily known here. The other thing, too, is you have you have certain people who are very into a, a scene, you know, so we have micro communities within our macro community. You have maybe people are really into dancing to salsa and they want just that or they just want Afro beats or they just want, you know, Bulgarian brass bands. I mean, there's a whole world within every community, you know, uh, and then there are people who are just like tasters at the buffet they want a little bit of everything obviously i'm i'm one of those you're probably one of those too yeah, we, we like to mix and match and and hear things from different places and and so you really have to cater to to both you know so for example i work with one artist who's a superstar in israel he's like the household name Idan reichel you go anywhere everybody's heard of him he has radio hits millions and millions of, of streams and views on youtube and things and uh, a big star and at the same time, when we were developing him and promoting him outside of his native country, we really wanted to build him as a world music audience, right? So how do you get his music into a non-Israeli uh, community and get them interested and excited about it? And so that's, that's part of the fun and part of the challenge is to find other audiences and other communities for your music. But <clears throat> I would say that ultimately it comes down to you know, who the audience for, for our type of music, for, the, for this global music is, they tend to be people who are um, what we would call cultural creatives in the marketing world. There's actually a marketing term for it. And a cultural creative can be, uh, you know, they tend to be a, a little bit more affluent. They tend to be a little more educated. You know, they've gone through college sometimes. Yeah, they exactly. tend to be interested in or have traveled to yes, some degree and or have a connection to a culture that they they have roots in 
Um, and that's really, that's really it. And frankly, that's, that's billions of people around the world. So the audience is, is massive. Um, I think the reason it doesn't get much coverage in the United States is because we're so focused on, on, on language in our music. I mean, things really, they have to be in English if they're going to get any mainstream radio play, first of all. And second of all, let's be honest, we're, we're kind of ignorant about the rest of the world in a lot of ways in this country. We don't, we don't have global perspective here. We're very U.S. focused. It's why we play baseball and football and not soccer. It's why we don't use the metric system. I mean, there's so many things about the U.S. that make us proud almost to be isolationist in how we think of the world. Like anything that's within our borders is the best. If you travel to other countries, I mean, even if you just go an hour north to Canada or certainly in France or various parts of Europe, people are much more open-minded to listening to music that's not in the language that they speak. And so you'll find mainstream radio and mainstream press covering artists from the Middle East, covering artists from Africa, from Japan. I mean, it's really interesting to see the difference. When I bring one of my artists from, let's say, Africa to Montreal, we'll have them on the equivalent of 60 Minutes, the equivalent of Good Morning America, writing, written in the, the equivalent of the New York Times, all the Quebec Fran Francophone-based media that's huge in that market, the equivalent of which in the U.S. would never cover the same type of music. So it can be really frustrating sometimes. Yeah, um, that's a good point about the, the English. It's, yeah, I've noticed that. And, you know, at times I've been extremely frustrated and at times I wanted to quit. Uh, but then I go back and I say, Carla, it's a niche market. You're doing something very unique and, you know, it's not for everybody and it doesn't have to be. But as I like to say, when I'm doing the show, doing what I love and knowing that it matters because it matters to these independent artists from around the world. Absolutely. So, I keep and doing I think it ultimately, and that's why you're yeah. here. <laughs> right. I mean, I think you're, you're motivated by similar reasons that I am. It's, uh, it's about the music and the music and the cultures that we love. But I think probably more than anything, it's about doing what, what we can to, to help people become aware of the diversity of the world around them, not just to be aware of it, but to celebrate it yeah. and to enjoy it uh, and not to think of people that are different from us as scary or, you know, something to be afraid of. People that are different from us, that's, that's what makes life interesting. And we, yeah. should, we should cultivate and celebrate that those things that make us different from each other. I love that. Yes, me too. So from an artist perspective, if I'm an artist and mm -hmm. I'm listening to this interview and I'm like, hmm, this label, I like what this guy is saying. I wonder if he's going to like my music. One, how do they reach you? And two, how do they know that they align for the label or for, because Kumbunch is also a booking yeah. agency, right? Yeah, although we don't do much booking now, of course, since the since the, the pandemic, we've been more focused on um, on music publishing. Um, what I would say to those artists is, for any any time you you're you're creating music and you want to pitch it to a record label, definitely check out the label, see what other artists are on the label, um, and 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 really make sure that you're pitching something that is appropriate for that that record label for sure. I, I get sent a lot of music that. It really isn't in my area. And what is in your area, though, because I'm looking at your artists here. I get it because I know I don't know all of them, but I do know a majority of them, maybe like 70 percent of the ones that are here. Yeah. What is like that unique sound that you're looking for? Or is it a it, it is hard sound to explain, and, and personality? But, yeah, yeah, I would say uh, I mean, when I started Kumbancha, I told people that my 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 goal with the label was to find the next Bob Marley. And what I meant by that was trying to find those artists that are coming from a cultural place that are, that are examining their traditions and their roots and their heritage, yet are creating music that people from any culture or any community can find something to connect with. You know, even if they don't understand the words, they could either connect through the melody, through the rhythm. And so I'm looking for music that's, fairly accessible. You know, I'm not looking for things that are really experimental or avant-garde or esoteric. There are other labels for that. I, I'm really looking for songs, strong melodies, strong songs, and also strong stories. I'm looking for artists that have something interesting to say or, or came from a 
uh, out of a particular situation that um, that goes beyond the music. So, for example, I worked with Sierra Leone's Refugee All Stars, who were formed in a refugee camp during the war in Sierra Leone, and and their whole story was about the power of music to help you overcome uh, struggle. You know, when you when you're really uh, struggling, what can music do to help you uh, sustain yourself and survive? I worked with. Andy Palacio and the Garifuna Collective, whose whole mission was the revival and revitalization of a dying culture, of the Garifuna culture and language. And what did his music do to help protect, to preserve and to promote that culture? Um, that was a big part of the story. So story and, and, and what, what the real significance of the artist is, is also really important. I'm not, not just looking for ear candy. You know, I want something that's got some depth to it. Um, so that that's important. What I would also say to artists is just because it doesn't necessarily work for me or just because I don't have the time or the, the ability to do everything, even things I really, really love. Um, it's not a it's not a judgment in terms of the quality of the work. It, it really is about what fits for me and what I have the time to work on. One of the things I am really happy about, you know, obviously with Kumbansha, we only put out a few records a year. We're very limited in the types of artists that we are able to take on. Um, but with Putumayo, of course, we're doing playlists, we're doing compilations. And so I can use a lot more material through Putumayo. And a good part of my day is actually spent listening to music uh, with the idea of finding great songs for Putumayo compilations. And the best ways to send music to me for that, and for Kumbancha for that matter, is to use uh, two platforms. One's called SubmitHub, and the other is called Groover. So if you go to submithub.com or groover.co, both of those are music submission platforms. And you can send me music through those platforms and I'll listen to it and I'll even send you comments back on it. Awesome. Now, are you also interested in investors, supporters, um, some type of financial backing? I'm but always happy listening. to accept free money. <laughs> uh, the reality is generally money isn't free. <laughs> so uh, obviously there are well, times. We're when... in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of free money here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I know there's, there's, there's plenty of money, but, but investors always want something in exchange. Uh, they either want, uh, you know, the assets that you're creating or they want some say over the, the direction that you go in. And uh, I think for Kumbancha, I've been honest with myself that it really is um, my own personal project. <laughs> and I would rather maintain that level of independence and freedom to pretty much do whatever the heck I want over uh trying to grow it just for the sake of growing it, you know, like there really is um, a time and a place for that. And um, I enjoy the flexibility that I have with Kumbancha. There have been times throughout the, the years that our company is in business, it has been in business where some capital would have been nice, but honestly, I've never really struggled with the company. I've always had uh, enough money to make things happen. Um, and even in the pandemic times, we've actually been fairly profitable. So uh, I think part of that it just comes down to being realistic with how much you spend and uh, staying on top of the numbers. You know, that's what I try to do. And uh, from a career perspective, can you talk a little bit about what skill set is needed? What have been your struggles as an entrepreneur in this area? So someone is pretty passionate about music and then world music or, you know, doing something different like world music in the United States. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for them based on your experience? Well, the funny thing is, you know, I, I studied uh, ethnomusicology at UCLA. I got my master's degree there. And nobody, not even me, had any idea what I was going to do with that field. <laughs> you know, most likely I would end up being a professor. You know, yeah. that was that was the most likely scenario. But since that time, when I entered into the music industry, I have done so many unbelievable things that I didn't know were possible. I, I did, you know, I I worked with a distribution company and a small record label before I started with Putumayo. 
Then I got hired by Putumayo to travel around the world and listen to music. Then I started my own record label. Then I started working in television and I hosted a music and travel television show for nine oh, years. You did. Yeah. And then I also got uh, hired or started working with National Geographic doing uh, music and lecturing on their high end cruises around the world, their expeditions. And all oh, of these. Jake, have you had a fun life? I have had a very fun life with a lot of travel, a lot of adventure, a lot of excitement. And none of it would I have predicted was possible back when I was getting my start in this career. I, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. Um, so what I will say to people is that, you know, you definitely follow your dream and follow your passion because you don't know where it's going to lead. You don't know uh, what can happen. Um, but I will say that it, it's a lot of hard work, you know, like you do have to be willing to basically work your butt off. Um, you have to be, uh, creative, you have to be communicative, you have to multitask and develop all types of skills. I mean, in my life, I, I do everything from web design to graphic design to music production and recording to tour management, road management to accounting and bookkeeping. I mean, music, film editing, you name it. If I've had to figure out how to do it, I'll figure it out. And so you really have to be um, you know, willing to learn constantly new things, develop new skill sets. Um, if I can avoid hiring something to do, hiring somebody to do it and, and do it myself, I will. And, uh, you know, that that has enabled me to get a lot more done with less money than than some other people might have had to do. So I, I don't know. I mean, the, the best advice is is follow your passion. Be realistic about it, you know, in the sense that um, you have to be practical and and um, try to find, you know, you know, try to be realistic about what the possibilities are, but you don't necessarily know what they're going to be before you get started. You know, so that's all. Do you need to have built relationships with labels or artists beforehand? Well, not necessarily beforehand, but you do have to cultivate relationships. I mean, that's one of the things that I deal after, after 30 years in the music business, I know a lot of people. You know, I know who to call when I have a problem in any country in the world, practically. If I've got an issue I need resolved in Mali, I know who to call, you know. So I basically have developed uh, really close relationships with a lot of people and sometimes not very close, but, you know, you're calling in favors all the time. So for me, whenever anybody asks me a favor, I do it because I know someday I'm going to ask somebody else a favor. And uh, that, that just kind of is part of cultivating relationships, you know, doing favors for other people whenever you can. Yeah. All right. Now let's jump in, um, talk a little bit about some of the artists that you have on your roster right now. Is your website pretty updated if I can use it as yeah. a reference? Okay. The thing, yeah. Now, Dobe Ganore, Ganore, is that how you pronounce her name? It's uh, Nyore, like with, uh, like Gnocchi, you know, Gnocchi. Ah, like Gnore, yeah. uh, okay. Gnocchi. I love her, her she's on yeah. fire, man, this new album is amazing. I've yes, seen her totally. live in Pittsburgh, and you probably remember this, the Acoustic Africa tour. Of course. Because Putumayo doesn't do a lot of tours, and that Not was anymore, an amazing no. one, so I met her. And she's on your label. And I met good, huh? Abib Koite. He's yeah, also he was part awesome. of it. Yeah. The one who's not on your label and I love is Vusi. Yeah. Vusi Mahlasela. Yeah, he's and awesome. And so it was the three of them at the concert. Um, so what do you like about Dobe? Well, first of all, you, you've seen Dobe perform live. So you know that she is literally one of the most amazing she's performers. She's like a, a Tina Turner. Earth. Yeah, she's like a Tina Turner. Exactly. She puts the most, she puts everything into her performances. I've, I've been at shows where I've kind of felt bad for her because I, I see how much energy and emotion she's giving. And I can't imagine what that is like, you know, like for an artist to have to give as much as she gives every show. Um, but she does it and she's, she's full of life and full of energy. And, um, I just think she's a really, really spectacular artist. But the main reason I, I, I'm working with her on this most recent record is we had worked together many years ago and, and then she started doing other things. And she came to me uh, recently with basically with a finished record, something she'd been working on. 
in the Ivory Coast. And she was like, what do you think? And I was like, hell yeah, this is great. I was really excited about the musical direction. It was fun, catchy songs um, at a time when people really needed some upbeat music, you know? And uh, she wasn't dwelling on the, the realities of the situation. She was celebrating being alive. She was celebrating being a woman. She was celebrating kind of a new energy in her life and in Africa. And I, I just love that that mood and that vibe of a, of a, of a you know, modern woman. And um, so she's just a fantastic artist. I feel so, so lucky to be able to work with her. And she works, uh, she works really, really hard. So she's actually already recorded another album. <laughs> oh yeah? Yeah, it's not, As it's still much in stages. Yeah, she, she went to the Ivory Coast uh, last month and she was like, oh, maybe I'll do some recording. And I was like, cool, yeah, send me the demos. And then she comes back, she goes, it's done. I was like, what's done? my album. I was like, what? Um, but yeah, she's just a workaholic. She, she loves to work. So I'm happy. With so that. she represents the Ivory Coast. Colonian, who do they represent? Sweden. Ah, Sweden. They're my first Nordic signing. And uh, the story with Colonian uh, is really interesting because um, I, I travel a lot to, to Scandinavia with National Geographic. Um, and I programmed a lot of music up there. And over the years, I've become really fond of Nordic music and culture. I wasn't that familiar with it up until recently, but I've grown to love the sound of the music and, and many of the artists and the folklore of the region. And so I'd been familiar with the band Kolonian because they're kind of stars in, in Sweden in the folk scene. And then randomly, in just a very weird coincidence, a friend of mine in my small town in Vermont uh, hosted them for a house party at their at her house. You know, she just had a house concert. She said, oh, I've got this band coming from Sweden, Kolonian. And I was like, Kolonian, I love Kolonian. <laughs> so I I first saw them perform live right here in, uh, in small town Charlotte, Vermont. And we hit it off instantly. We, we hung out together the whole weekend, my wife and I, and we just partied and played music and just really enjoyed them. And I enjoyed their company. And I said, well, you know, that's why I'm in this business to work with people I enjoy working with. And I really love your music. So shall we work together? And they said, yes. And I said, yes. And we got married. All right. Musically. Hey, that's, a, that's a good example. <laughs> they, they didn't have to pitch to you. You kind of created the relationship before you became business partners. And so yeah. And that's part of it. That personal connection can be really important. You know, it does happen, though. I have I have found artists that have just sent in demos and I've ended up signing them. That happened with Sangeet, who's another new. Yeah, combined. I was going to ask about that because you've been uh, promoting this new album a lot. So talk yeah. about that. Yeah, so that that was a situation where Sangeet reached out to me. Um, he had done a series of videos that were kind of like playing for change type videos with different artists collaborating from all over the world. And I really liked them. I said, wow, he's, he's, he's really pulling a lot of interesting people together. And so I said, well let's do something together. So we started to work together. We've never actually even met in person. We've only been talking uh, through digital platforms and over the phone and uh, he's just producing some great music and I'm helping him spread the word about it. Yeah, I'll be playing. Um, I just got your, um, your package on him. So I'll be playing him. Let's say being Brazilian, I've seen Luisa Maita. I haven't seen anything new from her recently, but why did you like her? Wow, well, yeah. It's been a while since Louisa has been to the U.S. and it's been a while since she's recorded anything new. I, I've done two albums with her. Um, she she went in a very different musical direction with her second album, much more electronic, more hipster, uh, indie rock almost. Uh, and I uh, honestly, I preferred the first record and, and um, the kind of more acoustic approach that she took with it. But she keeps telling me she's going to go do a, a classic samba record. And I'm like, oh, I'm interested to hear what you'll do with that. We'll see. So uh, I'm not sure what, what her plans are for the future, but I, I would love to have her back. In yeah, the she does have some good music. And here from the Bay Area, I have not seen them live, but I think I will have an opportunity. Rupa and the April Fishes. Yes, that was an early group on the label. I think their record was my seventh record that I ever put out. And um, they were introduced to me by a radio DJ in San Francisco named Rosalie Howarth, who was the radio DJ on uh, KFOG. If you remember the KFOG radio station up there, which was a main. She was also the co-host of the Putumayo World Music Hour, which is a radio show that we oh, okay. 
And uh, Rosalie had heard about them in the Bay Area. They were making quite a buzz. And I just love their sound. I love the mix of cultures, the francophone element. Uh, Rupa herself is an incredible person. She's a, a doctor by day and a musician by night. Um, she's a firebrand. She's very, very political. Um, you know, her music has a mission and that's part of what I liked about it. It had a story to tell. Um, so uh, again, we, we put out two records with Rupa. Uh, she has not been doing as much music performance lately. She's been mostly focused on her writing career and her family. Um, but she continues to, to, to perform once in a while. So hopefully you've got a chance to see her. Um, I'll pick two more here since we're going to be running out of time soon. Uh, Nova Lima. I love them. I've yeah. seen them here in Oakland actually. And I sure. saw, no, I only saw them once in Oakland. I just, uh, just been following. I've played a lot of their music and I turned a lot of people into their music. Mm -hmm. Um, and they keep going, right? They're still recording. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, Nova Lima, um, that was also an interesting one. They're, they're, I'm a big fan of Afro-Peruvian music, always have been, um, since I first uh, first started hearing Susana Baca and some of the early Afro-Peruvian uh, artists you know, that, that, that were being introduced to the world through David Byrne and others. Um, and so I loved this idea of young musicians taking traditional Afro-Peruvian music and coming up with a way to connect it to a more contemporary audience. So the whole concept I, I was really into this, it really intrigued. And I thought Nova Lima did, they approached it with a lot of respect. You know, they really, they weren't exploiting this music. They were working with actual musicians, not doing remixes. They were recording new material and they were coming up with really creative ways that maintained the core of the Afro-Peruvian musical identity, it also helped it connect to the dance floor, you know, to like contemporary yeah. clubs and so forth. And so um, I, I had been a fan of theirs and they contacted me at one point and said, would you like to work together? And I said, of course. So we, uh, we had a nice time working on a couple of projects. Was, did you ever work with Bossa Cuca Nova? Not uh, as a label, but we've licensed some of their songs for Kutamayo collections. And, and I know those oh, okay. guys hung out yeah. with them. That's yeah. another one that I think they take a lot of traditional bossa nova and turn it into, you know, more electronic sounds. I really like them. Yeah, yeah, they're some really great. And another one that I've been following, I actually met him live here in San Francisco. He came down to do a show is Ricardo Lemvo and the Machina Loca. <laughs> I've sure. always liked him and he's still making music and he's in the L.A. area. Yeah, I mean, Ricardo is an old, old friend of mine. When I when I went to grad school at UCLA, I knew Ricardo. I used to go see him play at clubs. And this was back in, dare I say it, the early 90s, right? So he's been doing this for a long, long time. And our relationship deepened when uh, Putumayo actually signed Ricardo and put out two records. Oh, that's right. With him. I, I may have that album, the first yep. album. They did yeah. Mambo Lolo. That was their, their, their record. And... You know, Ricardo, uh, that was back when Putumayo had like an artist division that didn't last very long. Um, but I maintained my relationship with Ricardo. So when uh, an opportunity came to put out a record with him, I was excited to, to do yeah, it. Yeah, plus he does the, the Afro-Cuban that you like so much. Oh, yeah. He, he coalesces all of my favorite music styles into one. I love I love that mix of Afro, African and Latin flavors. It's, it's certainly one of my favorite sounds. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all we have time for today, Jacob. And um, let me just ask you, I was going to ask you for one favorite Putumayo compilation albums, but I'll give you two since I know it's hard yeah. picking one. <laughs> so hard. I think I've worked on oh, probably over 350 or maybe, maybe like it doesn't have to be your favorite because it's hard to pick one, but one that had a like an influence, like for me, the North African is a big one for me. I love that album and I have nothing to do with that area of the world, but I just love that album. Yeah. It really resonated with my, my listening. Well, the ones that, uh, for me personally, that, that, uh, I tend to enjoy the most are the ones that I have fond memories of putting them together. And I also felt like we were doing something very unique with mm -hmm. them. Um, so an example of that was Brasilero. I don't know if you remember that compilation, yeah. but that was, it's long out of print, but it was one of the first Putumayo compilations I ever worked on. And I just, you know, it gave me an opportunity to basically listen to 
hours and hours and hours and hours of Brazilian music. And it was so much fun. And, and since then we've put out dozens of Brazilian music collections. And so I'm just constantly listening to new music, but I, I, I loved the, the, the final sequence that we had for Brasileiro. I think it really worked nicely. Another one that I, I loved working on was uh, Turkish Groove, which was a Turkish compilation. I love that too. Yeah, and uh, that was fun because I went to Istanbul and really dug into the Turkish pop music scene and had a, a really good time uh, exploring that part of the world. And, um, and then one that I really loved because it was sort of groundbreaking at the time was Republica Dominicana, which was a compilation oh, of yeah, music from the Dominican too. Republic. And at that time, nobody had really heard much bachata or even that much merengue of this traditional style that we were exposing. So for a lot of people, it was their real introduction to music from that, that country. And so I was really happy to be a part of that. Yeah, great. All right, well, thank you so much for being here on KCSU. It's been great to talk to you. Maybe we'll do a, a part two and we'll talk about some of the other artists on the label. Very good. And like I said, I, I'll send you uh, the links to the TV show that I worked on in case oh, yeah. you know, that'd be cool. interested. But oh, uh, it was called Music Voyager, and uh, we went all over the globe and hung out with some amazing artists, and it's a really fun, really fun TV show. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you very much. Bye. See you next Bye. time. Bye-bye.